Welcome to the Pixel Retentive Podcast, where we, a business owner and an artist, discuss the business of art and the art of business. Hey friends, I'm Carl, founder of Epic Made. And I'm Ross, creative director at Epic Made, and we're the hosts of the Pixel Retentive Podcast, where we share our thoughts on creativity, art, and business. Past guests include Marcy Selzberg of Blah Blah Blah, Rebecca Blake of the Graphic Artist Guild, and Justin Ahrens of Rule 29 and the Creative Shit Show podcast. We're forever grateful for the supporters of our podcast. And as always, we're looking for more sponsors. That said, Pixel Retentive is always brought to you by the creative gurus at Epic Made. Epic Made is a studio of creative storytellers fueled by a lifelong passion for entertainment and pop culture. We make Epic Creative for brands that share our passion for nerd culture, entertainment, and tech who need to get noticed by their millennial audience which we've already done for some of the biggest entertainment brands on planet Earth, like WWE, Sci-Fi, and Nickelodeon. Visit getepicmade.com and let's collaborate on your next creative adventure. So with us today, we have Fred S- Seibert. Seibert, you got All it, right. babe. I love saying, I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I get that right. So Fred, Fred is a living legend in the entertainment and animation industries. He co-founded MTV. He was the president at Hanna-Barbera. He's the founder of his own Frederator Studios and Fred Films. Uh, He's helped put Nickelodeon on the map and has helped launch dozens of iconic cartoons, including Dexter's Lab, Johnny Bravo, Courage the Cowardly Dog, and uh, as well as two of my favorite shows of all time, Adventure Time and Netflix's Castlevania. Wow. Wow. Uh, well, welcome, <laughs> thank you, Fred. Uh, we are super excited to have you here. So, Fred, what do you think about animation? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. At, at least I loved it as a kid. Yeah, that's what got me in. Yeah, thank you. But the truth be told, you're probably still a kid in the core, right? You still have a love for this stuff, huh? I do, though. You know, I I'm not a big watcher of animation, and I haven't been since I was a kid. Oh, wow. I'm not one of those people who sort of, you know, ground through every piece of it and all that type of thing. It was it was a part of what turned out to be my cultural and creative life. Mm-hmm. And I do tend to be one of those people that hang on to the things that meant to me, meant something to me at a certain point in my life. Cartoons happen to be one of them. Oh, wow. Well, Got that's it. really, uh, really that. powerful. And, you know. God, visual storytelling and cartoons, like they really can resonate with people and give you a whole perspective and like really just in a way that almost nothing else can because there's so much versatility in that. And, you know, that may change in the future here as these technologies collide and what we can do in animation becomes essentially live action, which is. uh, Well, that's that's already (laughs) happening, you know, certainly in the superhero movies in particular, but I'm actually amazed at the tiny small dramas that i see that all of a sudden there's lists of this many you know um visual, visual effects effects artists. Artists. <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't know what's going on in movie making but so it goes cool well uh tell us a little bit about you know your journey because it's it's been quite amazing one from what I, we can tell and uh you know i've read about on your website but yeah i'd love to hear hear it from you well the way i'm feeling right now it's certainly been a long one Mm-hmm. Um, you know, cause I'm old number one <laughs> and number two, because I didn't have a clear path that I followed. I thought I was on a clear path, but as it turned out, as I'm fond of saying, I've more been like a ping pong ball in the wind tunnel of pop culture. Oh, for- and I've tried to touch all sorts of pieces, um, Briefly, if I can, I, I, I'm not brief on anything, but I'll try. Um, <laughs> Neither I grew up. All right. <laughs> I grew up in the suburbs of New York on Long Island uh, to two parents who were pharmacists, and decided at six I'd be a chemist. And I was a math science kid for most of my schooling, so much so that I went to college to study chemistry. Nice. Um, wow. But I noticed something in the first couple of months that I was in college, which is that when the Beatles hit America when I was 12, 
um, a little nuclear bomb went off in my head and blew up everything that I expected out of life. Oh. And I, I walked into my lab at school in, in college and I looked at my lab mate and I said, you know, the Beatles, the Beatles mean more to me than this. And I walked out and, you know, never went back, went back in. Wow. Um, and that really sort of set this process that this journey, as mm -hmm. you're asking me about it in, in motion, because you know, at 12, I became a fan of these four little black and white figures in my home television and started trying to figure out like what it meant to me. Right. Um, so I had a band, you know, like in my time, the exact same way that everybody has a TikTok account, mm -hmm. uh, we all had bands, <laughs> right? Nice. And it didn't matter if your bands were good or bad. Mine was, you know, started bad. It got better. Um, I thought that was my life, you know, that I was going forward in the, in the music realm. Oh, right. Um, and when I got to college, I was as interested in, um, not necessarily how you wrote or played music, but how you got it onto that vinyl records that we you know, all had at the time. Yeah. And I was in, interested in the microphones and the amplifiers and, you know, the instruments as much as anything else. And I started doing recording in my, at my college radio station. The challenge was that my college radio station specialized in classical folk, neither of which I had any interest in and jazz which I also had no interest in, but I was more interested in. Right. And so I started recording all of these very, starting with very avant-garde jazz musicians, a few mainstream people here and there. And I, um, a buddy of mine and I from my hometown decided to start a little, little record label in the early 70s to record my friend, mm -hmm. but to launch the label, it turned out we, I had recorded with him or for him, a 70 plus year old blues man from Mississippi at a small club in uh, Greenwich village who had an international following and we put out a record and all of a sudden I'm in the record business, which I thought was the coolest thing in the universe. Wow. Nice. So much so that I just kept trying to get jobs at record companies and nobody would give me a job. So I kept recording our own records. Huh. Um, so you're really, blah, blah, you're really blah. interested in the technology of it. Like the. I was interested in the capturing of it. And I was ah. interested in, you know, I was interested in the tech, but uh, it wasn't like I was an, an engineer in the sense of right. I knew how anything worked. You just like you know, preserving I, that moment of music, that experience, I, I, I take it? Yeah, because to this day, I'd rather listen to a rec, you know, recording than go to a live show. It's not that I... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, me too. Yeah, at this point, I don't even like live shows. Yeah, you know? yeah. They, they bore the crap out of me because I found out, with the exception of five or six artists that I've seen in my life, that after the third song, I heard everything they had to offer, <laughs> you know, um, at least in a live setting. Right. Right. Um, the challenge was that I was more interested in the process than in making a living. Yeah. And um, I never graduated from college. I had a roommate that paid all my bills for five years while I was trying to figure out, well, why a record company wouldn't give me a job, you know, that type what of a thing. wonderful friend. <laughs> he was still my friend 50 years later. And I, in my mind and sometimes to his face, I thank him every day. Oh, beautiful. Um, and, you know, like I peaked in earnings at $2,500 a year at that point. Mm. And through a complete set of accidents, I got a job at a New York city country music radio station in their promotion department, like making, you know, 30 second promos for whatever it was we were doing. Sure. Um, and I, I had this brilliant, but insane mentor 
who um, uh, at one point we stopped talking because he was so crazy, <laughs> like for a couple of years. And in that period of time, he recommended me to an X radio guy who just started in this new technology of cable television. Mm-hmm. And uh, the guy calls me up. Now, uh, again, put it in context. He was 25. I was 27. And he calls me up and he said, hey, I heard you might want to work for me in cable TV. I said, well, no, um, I watch TV. I don't make it. He said, ah, you know, come have a drink with me and we'll let's talk. Yeah, he'll figure something uh, I don't out. drink. Yeah, I don't drink. So I went, you know, had a cup of tea. And when I was done, I realized that this guy was smarter than the boss of my radio station. Oh. And one of the things my mentor had taught me is don't worry about the job, just worry about the boss. Mm-hmm. And I, I left our drinks that night. I walked in the next morning, quit my radio job and went to work for the sky in cable TV. Old and dude. that just, that just started the career that I've had ever since. Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's where the co-founding of MTV kind of came into play. And then eventually. Yeah. Yeah. So one question I had that was interesting to me, just on the creative and the inspiration side, what was it about the Beatles and that like listening to the Beatles that, that like really stopped you in your tracks and like made you pivot your, your, your whole life at that point you set up until then you were a math science guy doing, you know, this kind of stuff. And it was like, I love the Beatles. And then you quit. And you know, what was, you know, just real quickly, what was that? Do you think? Fuck if I know. I, I mean, Beautiful. you know that, but you know that's the great thing about creative, about yeah, great creative stuff. Yeah, yeah. totally. No, you know, you're, like you're I right. Had, you know, the, the year before, you know, at summer camp, I watched the girls dance to the Four Seasons, and you know the pop music of the day, and you know, watching the girls dance made me like the music. Hey, you know, um, dance, dancing girls is, when, uh, you know, definitely a good thing for yeah, but <laughs> so. wa- watching those four guys. I don't know, you know, like, you know, the, the, the famous moment, I was part of the famous moment as a viewer on television was they hit this Sunday night television show called the Ed Sullivan show, which was the biggest variety show for, you know, two decades. And they hit those core. I mean, I don't want to go too far in the weeds. Three months before they were on television, Mm -hmm. my English teacher at the time in seventh grade was literally English. And she was an exchange teacher. And she she caused us all to write, you know, have pen pals in her class in Mm -hmm. England. And they all wrote back to every one of us in the class. Do you know about the Beatles? And they drop, you know, pictures from the magazines. We're like, who cares? We like, no, we haven't heard of yeah. these people. We never will. Yeah. And, you know, that was the end of that. And three months later, the world changed. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, it's had such an effect on me that they're my metaphor for everything that I do in my work, like literally everything. Wow. You point to anything you ask me about, I can find the metaphor back to the Beatles. Business, <laughs> creative, graphics music, you know, dressing, you name it. Like it all like goes back to that moment. Yeah. They were revolutionary and innovative uh, and just yeah. like in their boy, their approach to everything. And they kept reinventing themselves and just, yeah. just continuously well, me, just, just crush the market of like, to me, that's what was the biggest thing. Like in retrospect, the um, constant need that they had to move forward. Yeah. In fact, you know, one of the companies I started in the internet video age was called Next New Networks. And believe me, those first two words go back to my understanding and Mm -hmm. absorbing of the Beatles in that period of 10 years that I paid attention. Yeah. Yeah. They're just, they were a powerful collective of human beings. The only one left is still is Paul McCartney, right? And Ringo. Ringo. So, oh, yeah, that's right. Yes. Okay. The most undersung drummer uh, next to Stevie Wonder in popular music. Yeah. 
and you, you know it's so sad that like this is these are literally like such iconic human beings and i, I remember a couple of years ago when kanye did a collaboration with paul mccartney and i was seeing comments on the internet like oh i don't know who paul mccartney is but he's about yeah. to blow up i was like have some but respect that's, like, but that's how it is right yeah. i mean th- whoever wrote that shouldn't have known who paul mccartney is the fact that people do is interesting but you know the truth is i had no idea who frank sinatra was when people mm-hmm. told me that the beatles wouldn't last as long as frank sinatra Fair. right yeah you know? No, that's and true, and it's just he, generational exposure to that generation's pop culture. Yeah, you know? it's yeah. it's always. part of it's part of moving on and and culture evolving, and you know that the longer you can remain a snapshot of your time it is impressive. But Fred, to like to your point, the Beatles have such a long lasting reputation, even longer than their own time, because they kept evolving and they kept sure. changing with uh, their generation. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I was shocked when the Beatles and Bob Dylan would say that they wanted to be like Elvis or like Little Richard or like Chuck Bear. I'm like, why why would you want to be like them? Mm. You know, they're old. You know, you're (laughs) you. They're old. And what were they? They're probably five years older right? Right. or something like that. But I'm with you. I mean, the thing is, um, interestingly, in my current life, the thing that's most interesting from, you know, just sort of my perspective is I generally make comedies. Right. And I have no interest in contemporary comedy, like none. (laughs) Wow. And the reason, and the reason I don't is because comedy is generational the exact same way music is. Mm -hmm. And I'm way past the due date. Sure. So like, you just can't relate to it. Is that what you're saying? Like it, I don't, I don't even know, you know, my son who loves comedy, he like said, oh, you should watch this or you should hear these guys or, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I do for 10 minutes and I turn it off. Mm, yeah. You know, the same way that my parents, you know, who loved what we'll loosely call the 40s and 50s generation of Jewish comics, you know, um, when Saturday Night Live came out in 1975, and I said to my parents, oh, you should watch this. They're like, oh, no, there's nothing funny about that. Yeah, you know, and, that's interesting. And, and by yeah. the way, as it should be. Yeah. I, I shouldn't be interested in the comedy that my son uh, likes because it's not it's not meant to tell me anything. Ooh. Right. Right. These are these are generational stories, right? Completely. Playing off yeah. of uh, the comedy and relevance of you know their situations in life, right? Like. Yeah. And, and Ross, you know, I, again, I've said it a million times in public, but I turned down Adventure Time, one of the most interesting, fascinating, greatest things I've ever been involved in. I turned it down because it wasn't for me. Right. I didn't get it. Eventually I got it. Thank goodness. You know, (laughs) (laughs) what about, uh, just out of curiosity, what 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 about Castlevania, which seems like such a drastic departure from your current repertoire beat before that? I mean, it was it was mostly, you know, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Hanna-Barbera. Like there there's a Venn diagram where they all kind of overlap they fit together. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but lots of the... comedy. But Castlevania is not funny at all. <laughs> it's very dark and very serious. Very. Uh, there's a new one coming out, by the yeah. way, on Nocturne. September 28th, Castlevania um, no- uh, Nocturne. Yeah, I'm so um, excited for it. It's fantastic. Excellent. I had no interest in Castlevania. Nice. Like none. Um, and again, it, this this all sort of tracks back. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a fan. You know, that that's sort of what has characterized me since that Beatles moment, mm-hmm. probably before, but it was certainly that's the first one I noticed. And at various times when I move through the th- the various things that I do, the way I made decisions, you know, like when I decided I needed an album cover and my skills in that area were sadly lacking, as you could tell from the first two or three albums that I made, I called my oldest friend who I'd met when I was four years old, who 
already at that age was showing himself to be a talented artist. When we became teenagers, he was the one who introduced me to everyone from the monkeys to the mothers of invention. Continued to be a great artist. I helped him get his first job in art after he got out of college. And so I called him to make an album cover for me. Funny thing. Yeah. I then called him again when we were starting what became MTV to design a logo for this thing that we hadn't named and we didn't know what it was. So I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. And almost 20 years ago now, a guy came into my studio that I knew I'd known for several years uh, to work for us. And when we were shaking hands on the deal, he said, oh, you know, there are a couple of things I need to leave out of the deal because it's not what you do. And I said, well, what's that? He goes, well, you know, I love video games. I think video games are going to be a great source of IP for animation. I truly like I could care less about video games to this day, other than watching how important they are in the world. And uh, I said, well, what, what he said, well, you know, the biggest one is this Castlevania game from Japan. And I think I said, look, anything you're into, I'm into. So fine, just bring it along and, you know, we'll do what we have to do. And so we commissioned a script. He commissioned, he commissioned a script is what I should say for us. Mm -hmm. I had no idea who the writer was. He told me he was good. Okay, great. The script comes in. The guy had never written a movie script. It was for a movie originally. Right. And he said, will you read this? I said, well, I'll try. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't read scripts really well. Yeah. Um, and this is not subject matter that I have much interest in. Yeah, you didn't, sure. you didn't know the source material. You didn't you, you wouldn't you wouldn't have much say in what it actually was. Yeah. And because of that, I couldn't even really tell that it was written well, you know, but, but Kevin Coldy was his name and is his name. Mm -hmm. um, he told me it was good. I said, okay, done. Um, and then it took us 10 years to find somebody to partner with, to make the thing. Mm. And that ended up being powerhouse studios. No, it ended up being Netflix. Oh, oh, you um, mean to bring it to our house came afterwards. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we're um, always curious how all that works as you know, we have our own ideas and, and yeah, well, again, this, elaborate this is on a that fantastic a story that? that will make us feel good, all of us. Okay. okay. Powerhouse was primarily involved in making game video game trailers out of Austin, Texas. You know, having an animation studio in Austin, Texas is not the quickest path to success. <laughs> Um, we, we know in, in the yeah, world, yeah. right? Just yeah. like just like having an animation studio in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia, Virginia is not yeah, exactly like the success either. And um, but their team was like many people their age, really interested in anime, mm -hmm. and had made a very close study of how anime was made. Blah blah blah. You know, like all of the detail. And one day, somewhere there was some kind of press that we were interested in Castlevania. And the, the guy who eventually became the uh, second director on the project, um, he and his brother worked at the studio. Sam Dietz. And Sam Dietz and his brother, Adam, but it was Adam who went to Sam and to management, the guy who owned uh, Powerhouse, Brad Graber. And so we have to get in on this. And they wrote a complete proposal without having read the script, without having any idea what was on Kevin's mind, and sent him this proposal. And after really, after 10 years of Kevin trying to figure out how are we going to actually make this thing, he read the proposal and was like, oh, my God, they like read our mind. Perfect. And Castlevania, you know, came into Powerhouse as their first series they ever worked on. Um, and we're beyond the beyond in terms of being creative partners to, to Kevin and Warren on the project. Wow. It's fantastic. That is amazing and inspiring, honestly, uh, cause we've, yeah, had, I can get it. It's we've had inspiring to like me that. and I was part of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. 
But like that goes to show like our first piece of work we ever got with a name brand, like a household name was sci-fi. And we put in like there was an agency uh, out west that we put in, I don't know, 20 pitches with before they finally gave us a shot. And then now almost every time we pitch with them on something, it's like a 50 50. Like, well, they'll at least say, hey, you were you were like runner up or something. And it's like, you know, we don't pitch as much anymore because it just doesn't make sense for where we're at in the business. But the, there cool. was there's an MTV story that parallels it exactly. So um, it took us a year to get the logo for MTV and then management killed it. And then it took me months to get it back. Um. <laughs> And at that point, we're like, I don't know, two, three months from launch, and we have done nothing. <laughs> oh, that's fun. So for months, a guy showed up at our office, and my we, we it was so messed up. I mean, we, we were part of two big corporations, but we still had nothing and no money. <laughs> and my assistant sat out by the, was the reception desk for the office. My so-called office was a bunch of cubicles that had been hastily set up. My eventual creative partner, his office was um, a, a typing table and a step stool. And this guy came in to want to show us his animation reel. And so he'd say to my assistant, you know, and she'd call in and I go, I don't have time for that. And he'd just wait out in the reception area for hours at a time. And I wouldn't see him because I couldn't. And he would come back like almost every day. I love weeks. This <laughs> it might've been months. I, I don't even know. And so eventually we get the logo approved and I haven't lined up any animation vendors to do what I knew had to be a series of 10 second animations for our logo. Yeah, because it would, fl it would flicker the, between a bunch of different styles. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, when we get the approval and I look at basically the calendar, I shout out to my assistant, is that guy still there? <laughs> He's just been sitting there waiting for a shot. I love it. And and she says, well, no, he's out to lunch, but I know how to find him. <laughs> <laughs> he's on his lunch break from, from yeah, camping. And they become work friendly. Here. Oh, right. wow. So um, he comes back from lunch. He comes in, shows me his reel, which looked great. I found out later he and his partner had done none of the pieces on the reel. <laughs> cool. And I said, uh, here's what I need. I need 10 seconds. Here's all the sketches we have on the logo. I want them all to be in the first piece. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, they were stop motion animators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, how long will it take you to do it? How much will it cost? And he's like, I, we can probably get it done in six weeks and $5,000, which was exactly my budget. <laughs> six, six weeks would give us like till a week or two until the, you know, till mm -hmm. we went on the air and boom, he became one of our main vendors. And in fact, that shop, uh, won MTV its first creative award ever. Wow. And he and his partner went on to produce uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse for CBS. What? Nice. I loved yeah. Pee Wee's Playhouse when I was a kid. That, yeah. I used to watch that with my dad all the time. Yep. Do you mind if I ask so, you who that artist is? Well, he wasn't an artist. He was the producer. His name was Peter Rosenthal. His partner was named Stephen Oakes. And they had a studio in Washington, D.C. called Broadcast Arts. They eventually moved to New York, broke up, and Steve started a company called Curious Pictures, which did commercials and a few TV shows over the years and are no longer in business. Not, okay. not, you know, they just ran out their time. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very cool. Crazy. Dude, I love yeah. I love the grit of that, like the, the yeah. tenacity, right? That very much speaks to my own heart. Like I started this company That's why in I wanted 2006. To tell you. It's, it's yeah. pretty much what you did. Yeah, so, yeah. And I just kept showing up and doing things and going for it in every direction until we finally, like, it took me 14 years to get any, like, traction that, like, I was proud to tell people about. Like, I mean, I paid my bills and survived and, yeah. you know, but, all like, yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it is, it is the story that's told over and over and over again. And, you know, there's, like, an old cliche of, um, 
ninety percent perspiration and ten percent inspiration. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's you know, so true. Yeah. yeah. You know, sometimes you look back and you go, it was ninety-eight <laughs> percent, you know, and two percent inspiration. And we're lucky if we get the two percent, right? Yeah. yeah, you see it, you see it all the time. Um and, and actually just further speaking to that uh that point, like the second uh, we did get a chance with a major network. At, like Carl said, it happened to be sci-fi. We sent them our idea for the commercial. Uh, it was for a Pride Month commercial for their network. And um, they, we were the first studio they had ever greenlit uh, an animatic without any edits. Wow, like, fantastic. It was just, they, were, they were just like, yeah, we love it. Uh, move on. And the agent we were using was so flabbergasted by the fact that they, were, they didn't have any edits to send us. They were just a green light. Uh, it really helped confirm like what we were doing for the last decade, you know, was vilif- was like vilified, you know. Uh, well, the vilified, other thing, uh, not vilified. Uh, uh, there's man. a word for it. <laughs> yeah, this, vilified is making it bad. Anyways, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Um, well, the other thing that was, you know, as you're saying that, I just realized how unsophisticated we were. I didn't even know that there were people who repped um, firms like yours, mm-hmm. I just bought a magazine and literally went through the magazine and everyone who had an ad related to animation, I called them and asked for a reel. Oh, you know, like we, we literally had no idea. Right. And by the way, out of the hundred reels we pulled in, only one of them did we save. Um, and he he ended up being one of our first three vendors, but I, I mean, it, it was like, and the other two, one was the guy who sat outside on, at the reception area. And the other one was somebody said, here's a reel, maybe you want to look at it. And it was the last spot on that reel that made me want to hire them. Interesting. You know, so, you know, th- it is that tenacity, or as I say to all the, you know, young college students I talk to, I've fallen in the face first in the mud more often than I can imagine, even recently. And the only thing you can do is stand up and like clean the mud off and keep going. Totally. Um, yeah. And most people don't keep going. I mean, right. it's really as simple as that. Most people don't keep going. Yeah. You know, I, I saw a thing they were talking about, like, what are the most successful entrepreneurs and really anyone in any field have in common? And like, they really couldn't connect to a whole lot of things other than high risk tolerance and perseverance. Like, mm-hmm. and that's it. Like, do you, yeah. can you take the risk and can you keep going? And, uh, and that, that's it. I don't know if you guys feel this way, but I certainly do. I'm really glad that it took so long mm. because what I've seen over and over again is the people where it didn't take long, they, they crashed out. and burned faster yep. too. Yeah, well, the first time they hit a pothole, they'd get fully derailed because they have no experience exactly. being tough. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, no, it's really true. It's venerated, by the way. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, so- <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but no, I mean, so <laughs> welcome See, back, Ross. <laughs> thanks. Uh, no, it's um, it's crazy. I, I I think we do kind of feel that way because if we had gotten the chance with like a major network, um when we were still working with local clients uh it, we would have we wouldn't have had the the skill set we wouldn't have had the, we wouldn't have had the failures behind our belt right like yeah. yeah it's it's better to fail when it's low risk and you you can learn the high quality issue like the high quality uh like solutions from it without losing a whole lot yeah. but when you're when you're given the keys to the kingdom you have the whole kingdom to lose yeah like tr- trust me i've had some very fucking high profile failures mm-hmm. that you know certainly were on the edge of ruining everything that i had done up until that point Oof. you know and that's after having had all the low grade and low risk failures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and it just speaks to the character, right? And and your motivation, right? Are you doing this for the right reasons? Because if you are, right, whatever that is in your internal conversation, there isn't another option. You're not going to pack up and go, oh, well, I'm going to find the other thing. Like, it's this is my life, I, right? Like, that's why I tell Ross. I completely yeah. agree. I yeah. completely agree. Um, yeah. I always feel like I had no choice. Yeah. But to, but to move forward. 
It's like, you know, the, the, the thought that keeps coming to my head, the saying is like the difference between the master and the novice is that the master has failed more times than the novice has even tried. Right. Like, I love <laughs> I like that, that one. Yeah. I'm going to use that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, every time, every time something doesn't go as planned, if you're paying attention and you're, you're in the game for the right, like what Carl said, for the right reasons and because you love it, not because you're in it for like a quick dollar um, or quick success. Like you're going to pocket that and move on. And as long as you pocket all of these wrong ways to do things, you have less and less and less of a margin for error as you move forward. It's never zero. No, like you said. Well, it does get but, harder as you go along because there's more at stake. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, sure. um, when I um, started an agency, which I had no business doing and <laughs> things went south and you have 20 or 30 or 40 employees, you know, that's tough. that's tough. When I got married a second time and started, you know, having a mortgage and kids and then eventually responsible for hundreds of employees and like the high profile failure shows up, and your boss of your corporation tells you that the whole corporation's future is at stake because you fucked up, Ooh. you know, I mean, which is literally, I mean, these things have literally happened now that I'm thinking about, it. I'm actually getting the shakes just thinking about them. <laughs> it's all good. Um, it's all good. That'll give you the stress well, shits. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a lot at stake, you oh know, my God. And, yeah. but you know, what else can you do? I, I went broke. Um, now let's see seven, eight years ago. And um, it was the second time I went broke. And the first time was when my son was about two. And my wife, God bless her, who had had a much worse marriage uh, before than I did, um, said, well, you know, if we have to live in a smaller place, you know, I, I will do what we have to do. Mm, that's love. The second time, the second time, she was like, you know, We've done this before and we're old now. You can't do this again. You know, what are you going to do? That's practical, which is also yeah. love. <laughs> and she said, what, what are you going to do? And I said, well, uh, I have two choices. I can stand still, we'll die. I can take a step forward, something will happen. Yep. And she said, what will happen? And I took a lesson from a young tech guy that I work with. And I go, I don't know, but something will. Mm. something will happen if i take a step forward it's the only choice we have it's like what yeah. your dad used to say carl <laughs> dude why are you in my head ross yeah. my dad yeah. used to always say so my dad was a new yorker uh you know greek immigrant hustler at his core like always just moving and shaking and doing something and ran businesses and was an actor anyways long story short but he had a saying he used to always say like shit's only a problem when it ain't moving right and he had all of exactly. this whole this whole philosophy about shit and uh, he had this company called the official <laughs> the official shit company and like uh, he, he was a an insane caricature of a human being uh and, you know rest in peace old man but yeah so many good little nuggets of wisdom that i always lean into and that just reaffirms yeah. that like you if you're exactly. stuck you're dead right and that's what he would exactly. say but, but like if you're moving there's options you can pivot you can pivot you can keep pivoting as long as you're not stuck you're not dead like so exactly you know, it's it's a, it's truth for sure i've seen yeah i mean over you you know um there's a there's a saying i'd rather be exhausted than depressed right <laughs> like yeah. uh, you know the the, the <laughs> concept there. you know the the concept of just it, you don't you don't if you don't make time to sit in a setback then you won't you'll just move you'll you'll move to the next thing whether that's another failure or a you know a light at the end of the tunnel yeah you know? yeah totally but if you're just if you're just sitting there then it becomes problematic for sure nothing ever changes for sure yep super oh, fun man <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean it's, we, it's... We, well. Okay, we just exhausted the whole podcast. We're, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> well, actually, we are we are actually getting at time, so it's actually perfect timing if we're being <laughs> for sure. Uh, it, it's it's sort of come to a natural conclusion, and I mean, I'm uh, I'm really happy with everything that we talked about. Yeah, so. I think there's oh, so many amazing. great little nuggets of wisdom in here. 
uh, that our audience can take away and hopefully inspire them to do, you know, be their greatest version of themselves and and uh, keep their story moving. So, yeah. Before we do uh, leave you, Fred, we do have one last question. Uh, is there anyone in your career, uh, your very, very long career, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that you'd like to shout out, uh, you know, maybe a, a mentor, a valuable resource, a favorite project or favorite client? Um Gee, the list is so long on right. all of those things. Um, you know, I I loved, well, I loved everything I did. You know, I'm I'm really lucky. That's I've beautiful. only worked on things that I, you know, like. I mean, look, there are projects here and there. There are clients here and there. You know, I stopped having clients in the agency sense when I couldn't stand it anymore. I just closed the company. Yeah. You know, uh, my partner and I, we ended up couldn't stand each other for a minute too, because, but it was all because we couldn't stand our clients, you know? Yeah. And there was nothing wrong with the client. They were doing yeah. their job the way they needed to do it. I just like wasn't interested in what they had to say. It wasn't a cultural you know? fit for you guys. Yeah. It was just totally. Well, you know, it, it's, you know, one of the things that's great when you're young is you don't really give a crap what anyone else says. And if you do, you're not going to do anything interesting. Right. You know, um, the amount of energy it took to sell the MTV logo, I, I can't tell you. And it's one of the few things that people remember about MTV. <laughs> I know. know. Yeah. And the amount of energy it took me to sell the idea of making short cartoons as the, the kernel of finding great new series, it went on for years. Mm -hmm. And nobody bought it. I was, and I was too stupid to stop talking about it. Um, <laughs> and... It. And look where you it know, went. So, yeah, well, exactly. And by the way, I'm still talking about it and people still have no interest in it. <laughs> you know, it's it's really amazing, but it is what it is. Um, but, you know, I think, the and I have a long list of mentors. It's all on my personal website. I write about them on rare, you know, every once in a while I throw one in there. But my first mentor in the media business was really a guy who just passed away named Dale Pond. He was out of his fucking mind. Yeah, the you best know, time. Um, I did my audition for him at the country music radio station. And in the middle, he started screaming at me that it took too long and that I had been chatting with his assistant. And I shouldn't. And I literally had, I had no idea how to find a job at that point in my life. I had worked for my dad and mom in their drugstore my whole life. I had no job searching skills. So I got up in the middle of his tirade and walked out literally without saying goodbye. And he chased me to the elevator to hire me. And he's the guy that not only taught me so many lessons that today is a day that I'm already thinking about them, those lessons he taught me. He's the guy who like recommended me to MTV during the two years we weren't talking, changed my work-life trajectory completely. He's the guy I worked on the first animation project that I ever considered I worked on with him. Wow. You know, having no idea that, you know, 15, 20 years later, I'd be making cartoons for a little, I mean, you know, like whatever, he was the guy and it's awesome. who knows again, it's like the Beatles. Yeah. I have no idea why it worked. Everyone else couldn't stand him when I was writing about him as after he had passed away. And I asked a few people to give me some thoughts. One of the people just wrote me a, page long tirade about what an asshole he was which, <laughs> which, which by the way he was <laughs> but you know it worked for me yeah yep. well you know sometimes even being an asshole is what someone needs right there are people in this world yep. that treat people like they deserve to be treated good bad and indifferent and you know they need to hear that and they're going to yeah. be the ones that deliver the message right so and some people are just assholes for no reason too like but you know this guy sounds we, like we could an amazing we could do it yeah we could do a two-part podcast on just the lessons i learned from him oh, I wow. imagine. you know and and that i used regularly and used to this day very cool and and in fact when we hang up on the podcast i'll share one of them with you because it prompted me to think something about your podcast Okay. Um, and, but anyway, so he was the guy, it, um, Amazing. he's in my, he's in my, um, my personal Tumblr there under my mentors section. 
Okay. Oh yeah. Well, well, rest in peace to him and uh, God, the amazing, bet. amazing things that he did for you, uh, which is yep. just, just really cool. So thank you for sharing that. It's beautiful. No problem. And uh, you know, I would be remiss not to give a huge shout out to our mutual friend Andy Arkin, uh, who bet. seems to know everybody in this space. This guy, <laughs> oh my God, what what a what a what an amazing human being himself. So. Uh, he's probably snorkeling somewhere, taking pictures of beautiful fish on reefs because uh, that seems yeah. to be his but favorite he, thing to but, do, right? But now. he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to afford to go snorkeling with beautiful fish if he didn't know everybody. Yeah, no, yeah, he, that's what he does for a living. That's his job. He's great. Uh, he's a great guy at that. So cool, man. Well, we have been talking with Fred Seibert, who is the founder of Fred Films and Fred Raider, uh, and one of the fathers of modern cartoons. Uh, you can check out his website at fredfilms.com. And if listeners want to follow up with you directly, Fred, uh, where should they go? Do you have like a LinkedIn or? You know what? The fastest and easiest way is fred at fredfilms.com. Got it. Awesome. awesome. And I welcome anybody to get in touch. Hell yeah. All right, Fred. Well, thank you for being on the show. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And until next time, we'll see you again. Carl and Ross, good seeing you guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> We really hope you enjoyed the show. Please like and subscribe to join us on our next journey through the world of art and business on the Pixel Retentive Podcast. (laughs) 